Silence. 
to be in the house of the Lord today. Praise the Lord. I know the weather is looking a little gloomy outside right now and some people would rather stay in bed and stay cozied up. But I want you to look to your neighbor and tell them good morning. Look at your neighbors and tell them good morning. If you don't have a neighbor, look behind you or look in front of you and say good morning. Today I'm here in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're here to just learn about the power and the authority that was given to us and that was granted to us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you're not awake, I'm going to get you guys awake. <laughs> Amen. You see, this message, this study was prompted by the Holy Spirit, especially when we actually took communion last week. When we were taking communion together, I really focused on the importance of the body and the bread. What the body did for us and what the bread, and, sorry, the body and the flesh and the blood. When we took part in the cup and when we took part in the bread together, what is the importance behind that and what does it give to us? You see, we, get, we do this, um, we do communion every single month. And every month I renew my mind and I make sure that my mind is brand new every single month. Because we know the wages of the world today. It brings destruction, there is death, there is sorrow all around, everywhere where you look. And it's the body and it's his flesh and his blood that brings me back to the safe place. So when we were when I was taking the bread, I really thought of the power that lies behind the bread and when we take part in the cup. The power that is Jesus and the power that he actually gave to you and I. So when you took part in the body and when you took part in the cup, you have been granted power and you have been given authority. We studied in the beginning of this year the dunamis power 
the power that is granted to you. You have it. No one can take it away from you. It is yours to keep. And I want to talk about some different types of power and authority that we see in our world today. We see power in our managers. We see power in CEOs. We see powers in world leaders today. But each and every single one of them have a different type of power. For example, a manager can't do something that a CEO can do. And a CEO can't do something that only a world leader can do. There's different types of powers granted to each and every single one of us. And I wanted to share something very small that happened to me in the very beginning of this year, where I was, I was very nervous when we came into the year 2024. And I didn't know what God would do in my life, how he would um, orchestrate my life. And I remember being at work at, towards the end of 2023, December, and we were looking at the schedule, me and my colleagues. We were looking at the upcoming schedule for like the holiday kind of months. And I remember my colleague looked over at me and she said, Ruth, because I go by Ruth at work. And she said, Ruth, you're going to be a team leader for like two nights in the upcoming shift. I was scared. When I was telling you I was scared, I was scared. Because the team leader position is often given to people who have more experience and have years and years of experience because they have to watch over the entire unit, they have to watch over all of the patients, and to make sure that everything goes okay, you have to be able to have certain experiences and knowledge and skills. I was very nervous being in this position, but I gave it to God and I gave it into God's hands, and I completed those nights as a team leader. I give all glory and honor to God for giving me this opportunity because I was only given this opportunity when I was a year and two months into this job. Whereas people who are still longer don't get this opportunity sometimes. So I really do give praise to God. But where I'm going with this is that when I was given this power, a certain authority as a team leader, I was able to give new assignments to nurses. I would give new admissions to nurses. I would have to make a whole new assignment for the next day. Or sometimes I would have to talk to patient floor managers for the next day. And I would have to tell them what's going to happen, what's our upcoming surgeries like. This was something that was nerve-wracking for me. But this was some type of role that I was given. In the same way, your managers are given certain roles. Our pastor is given a certain role. Our CEOs, our leaders, our world leaders, governments, they're given a certain role. But just because they're in some type of leadership position and you feel as if you're not, doesn't mean you weren't granted authority. You have authority. Every single one of you has authority. You see, this authority came from not your own might and not your own power, but by the Spirit of the Lord that lives within you. So you can say, I don't think I can have leadership qualities. I don't think I have any power. You have power. Every single one of you has power. You've been granted this leadership position from authority and power because you are in the kingdom of God. You Every single one of us here, everyone in this building here, everyone that is saved, given their life to God, has been granted some sort of power and authority. So I want everyone to understand where did power and authority come from? Who gave it to us? Who allowed us to have any access to it? This is your birthright. I know the word birthright often goes to the firstborn individual of the family, but not this one. Authority and power is for everyone. It is not just for the oldest. It's not just for the youngest. It's not for the youngest and it's not for the oldest. It's for everyone. So I want everyone to understand that in order to bring fullness and fulfillment in your life, you have to understand and access that authority. Apply that authority. Acknowledge that authority. Be aware of the authority that God has granted to you. Amen? You have it. But how do you apply it? And how do you access it? So please, if you have your Bibles with me, turn to Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to take a look at what authority is, where it came from, who provided us with authority, and how we can access it. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 26 and 28. 
And we're going to read this together. Many of you probably already know that Jesus, sorry, God the Father, when he was making creation, he wanted to make man, and he wanted to make man in the likeliness of his image. So that's this scripture that we're going to read from verse 26 to 28. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to the likeness, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, and the whole earth, as well as the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God, and he created them male and female. Key verse here, chapter, verse 28 God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. He said to subdue it and rule over all of it. This is what's been granted to you. Subdue and rule. God gave us the power to rule and subdue the entire earth. We were granted and we were given this power by God. You see, subdue and rule, there's multiple synonyms that we can use. Have dominion over, have control over, have power over, have authority over. You have been granted this authority over the entire earth and everything that belongs on the earth and everything that crawls in the fish, in the sea, and the sky, you have been granted this authority. Now, the only problem is we have one person who doesn't want us to have that authority and have that power. Everyone knows his name as Satan. He is the enemy that comes to take away this power and authority granted to you. I'm, I'm assuming, but I want to know how many of you know that Satan was actually casted down when he was in heaven with God. How many of you know that Satan, who was with God, was casted down yes perfect if some of you do not know that I'm just gonna give a little recap Satan was so close to God so we have to acknowledge that he actually knows who God is he knows the power that God has but he wanted something even stronger he wanted to be above God mm -mm. One thing we have to understand is nor you, nor I, nor anyone on the earth is above God ever. He is and only is the most high God. Amen? There is no one above him. He is worthy of it all. He is the one that has dominion and power and glory and honor. It's him only. So Satan actually wanted to be above God. He wanted authority more than God. He wanted to be the one to dictate things that happened. And God wasn't having it. So God casted him down. And now he's here, roaming the earth. And this is when we know the story of the fall of man coming into place. If you were to read Genesis chapter 3, you would read about the fall of man that comes and happens. And because Satan wanted the authority, he wanted to make sure that he could do whatever he could to make sure that humans would not get any authority. So this would happen before God made uh, man in his own image. Satan is now casted down. He's roaming the earth. He's making sure that at least he has some authority over the earth. But then God comes in and says, I'm going to create man. And I'm going to tell him, you have to rule and subdue the earth. I'm giving you that power. I'm giving you that authority. But as soon as Satan heard of that, that man is going to have authority and power, he didn't like it because what did God say at the end of verse 28 in Genesis 1? He said, rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. That included Satan. He didn't like to know and he didn't like the fact that God gave power to these humans to have dominion and power over him. He was not going to have it. And I'm pretty sure it drove him insane to the point where he comes in and he puts a little doubt in their minds. You see, because Satan was so close to God 
and he knew the power of God. And because God gave those, this power to the humans and this authority to the humans, he knew the power and the authority that humans can have, especially over him. And he didn't like that. So again, he comes to do what he knows how to do best, which is kill, steal, and destroy. He comes into the garden where he, we know the story where God says to um, Adam and Eve, don't eat from this tree. Everything else in the garden that I've created for you, you can have it. But from that one little tree, don't touch it. Don't look at it. Don't touch it. Don't go to it. Don't go near it. But everything else you can have. Of course, us being who we are, we go to the tree and we get lurked in by the devil. This is when the enemy takes something so familiar to you and he will plant a seed of doubt to make it sound as if God is against you. God is not against you. God loves you. And it was because God loved them that he said, don't go to it. Please don't touch it. Obey and listen to my instruction. But Satan comes in and he plants a little seed of doubt and he says, why can't you touch that tree? Why can't you eat from it? You know God only wants to make it seem that he's only God and he doesn't want you to become like him. That's what Satan does best. That's what he knows how to do best. He makes it so that we turn against God, so that our relationship with God is broken. I don't want a broken relationship with God. I never want that. And it's going to be hard because all that I have to do is obey his instructions. But sometimes his instructions are hard to obey in my life because I want my way. I want my thinking. I want what I want. And I never want really sometimes what God wants in my life. So this is what happens when we do a half obedience kind of thing where God said, you can do everything here. You can have everything here except that one little tree. And because now... Eve took a bite from that apple, there was a little bit of half obedience. But half obedience still leads to some kind of disobedience. It's you, you do what God says you to do, and if you don't, that's disobedience. It's not one foot in and one foot out. It's you're obeying or you're not obeying. That's it. There's no other thing to it. You obey the word of God or you don't obey the word of God. You follow him or you don't follow him. There's, no, there's nothing in this life that you can do where you say, I'm just going to make sure that I follow some parts of this word, but I'm going to go outside and I'll just have maybe like one little smoke, but then I'll come back in and I'll just, you know, read the word of God. Wait a second. Let me read the word of God this morning, but let me go to the back here with my friends today and maybe I'll just have a little gossip session. There's nothing like that in this world anymore that we can have. We as Christians, we as followers of Christ, cannot be doing this. And that's why he says, obey my commands. Obey my calling. Obey the plans that I have for you, for they are not to harm you, but for you to prosper. So this is what, this is where authority actually came from. God gave the plan for man to subdue and rule all over the earth, especially over Satan. So you have power over Satan, but sometimes we give more credit to the enemy than we give to God. We say, oh, look, the enemy is really testing me today. Sometimes it's hard for me to comprehend why we say those things. Because you have been granted authority and power to have rule over him. And yet we give more credit to him sometimes. We've gone too far and we've strayed away from the word of God. We don't listen to his instructions anymore. And we just think that we can do it all by ourselves. We think that we're better off without God sometimes. But that's exactly what the enemy wants you to think. He wants you to think that you're better off without God. And that you can do everything on your own. But you can't. Your workplace, you can't do it on your own. Your family life, you can't do it on your own. Your relationships, you can't do it on your own. Siblings, can't do it on your own. Spouses, can't do it on your own. You have to have Christ at the center of everything that you do. Your workplace, your marriage, your relationships, friendships, everything that you do, you have to have Christ at the center of it. So God is giving you two options here, follow him or don't. Jesus being fully man yet fully God 
came into earth as a baby. Can you imagine Jesus coming in as a little baby and now having to depend on humans? He had to depend on Mary to make sure that he was fed, he was clothed properly. He was that humble. And he comes in and obeys the father at age 12 when he goes into the temple and starts preaching. Can you imagine at age 12 where others are listening to him preach? That's how humble he was. That's how meek he was. That's how knowledgeable he was. He always obeyed the instructions of the father. When you go and pray or when you speak the word of God to someone else, do you see a shift in the atmosphere of their lives, or even in your own life, when you go into a room and you shut the door and you start praying on your knees and you're repenting and you're just in the spiritual realm and you're fighting the war, do you see some kind of change happening in your life? We need to see this change happening in our lives. We can't stay the same anymore. We absolutely cannot. God has called us to be different. God has called us to subdue and rule, have authority and power over. So do we want to be stagnant? I don't. And I really hope that we as a church don't want to stay the same, but we want to grow and edify and just not get sucked into the world and its ideals. I was listening to this message once, and, and this, the preacher was saying, you can have all of the influences in the world. You can have all the, you know, charisma in the world. You can be really popular in the world. You can know world leaders, and you can be doing this with world leaders, and you can talk to governments, and you can do literally whatever you want, and you can think that it's really great, that I, I am in this really high position. But if you don't have the power and the authority to drive out demons and break strongholds and break chains, do you actually have the power to see it through? Because it doesn't matter the charisma and it doesn't matter the influence. It doesn't matter the popularity. What matters is the authority that was granted to you by God to take out the enemy. Jesus came with two things in mind. One, to destroy the works of the enemy and to bring God's children back to him. That's why he came. And yet, we sometimes don't acknowledge the authority that was given to us. Jesus understood that man was failing. If we can turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 19, this talks about the disobedience of one man being Adam and the obedience of another man being Jesus. And it says, Romans chapter 5, verse 19, For just as through the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, being Jesus, many will be made righteous. I am righteous because of Jesus. Amen? You are righteous because of Jesus. Amen? Can you agree that you have been made righteous? I have been made righteous. I have been made righteous. Can I see some arms being waved in the air, acknowledging the fact that you've been made righteous? Amen. Hallelujah. You have been made righteous because of Jesus, because of that one name, because of what he did for you. Contrary to what the world may think, the powers of the world aren't enough for the kingdom of darkness. You need the power and authority of God to really just defeat the demons in the kingdom of darkness. We see it here today. We see now missiles being blown off here. We see stabbings taking place. We see gunshot wounds. We see everything happening because we know that we're living really close to the kingdom of darkness. It's here. The end times are here. We might not want to admit it sometimes where we see signs that are taking place. You see the signs but we don't want to admit it. We don't want to admit that there is an actual kingdom of darkness and it's at work. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He looks around and he's waiting to capture someone. He's just waiting. All it takes is one act of disobedience for him to kind of just go in and take control. Don't give it to him. The power and the authority that was given to you, your birthright, it's not his, it's yours. So we have to actually apply it and use it. We, ha we can't just 
leave it into our hearts and say, I'll use it sometimes. I'll use it on a Sunday because that's actually when I come to church. I'll use it on a Sunday because when I'm here and I'm waving my hands and I'm saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, that's when I'll fight my spiritual warfare. No. It happens every single day that we have to do this. We fight this war every single day. We proclaim the name of Jesus every single day. We fight against the enemy every single day. There's strongholds being here and working, but it's only by your obedience and if you're going to use the power and authority given to you, if you're actually going to use it, use it in his name to fight against it all. I was reading a statistic that actually said that in, from the year 2000 until now, there's been about 23 million people who've walked away from Christianity. 23 million from the year 2000 until I would say probably 2023 because that's when I read the statistic. Can you imagine 23 million people walking away from Christ? And they've actually now gone on to being some atheists, some agnostics. Some people just believe in those things that are rocks. I cannot and will not agree with anyone who looks at a rock and tells them that they're getting power from a rock. I absolutely despise it. That is witchcraft. That is the work of the enemy. Your power comes from the name of Jesus. Amen? Your power comes from Jesus. Your power comes from the blood of the Lamb. Nothing else in this world will satisfy you. Just give me one thing, and that's Jesus. So from the year 2000 until now, 23 million have walked away. And it's a very sad thing because I believe it's not because they didn't get what they wanted and it's, you know, maybe they prayed for one thing and they just didn't get that. I don't think it's because of that. I think truly they walked away from Jesus because they never actually truly felt the presence of God. They never been intimate with the Father. They never actually stood aside from the world and closed that door, went on their knees, and just begged with God to see his face and to seek him at all times. I think that's the problem that we have here today. Why are we not experiencing his presence sometimes in our life? Why are we not obeying? Why are we not stopping to listen to him, to listen to the Holy Spirit, to walk with him, to listen to him, to fixate on his word, to meditate on his instructions? Why are we not feeling the presence of God? I so admire the Israelites in the book of Exodus. If we can turn to the book of Exodus, I believe it's chapter 12. In the book of Exodus now, Moses had told, sorry, God had told Moses to tell all the Israelites to take the blood of the lamb and to pour it and, and to spread it all on the uh, post edges of their doors, if you remember that. And if they did that, then the Spirit of God would pass over their house and, they, and um, this was the plague when God said that he would take the firstborn of every child, every, sorry, of every household. Um, and he said, but if you were to spread the blood across the uh, doorpost of your home, the Spirit of God would pass through and it would not harm anyone in that household. I admire the obedience that they had in this. Because their mindset wasn't, okay, 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 if I were to put the blood of the lamb, then my household won't be harmed. That wasn't their mindset. It was, God said it, I'm going to do it. That was what they had. They had an act of obedience, and it was this prophetic act that revealed this submitted heart to God. Sometimes we don't want to. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's also easy. But we have to fixate on what God wants. It's very easy for us to say, I want this, I want that, I need this, I need that. But it needs to be for God's glory. And if it's not for God's glory, it's not going to happen. It always needs to be for God's glory. Everything that we do, our education, our workplace, our families, our marriage, our relationships, siblings, uh, relationships, friendships, workplaces, everything ultimately comes back for the glory of God. It needs to be for the glory of God. Are you glorifying God in your workplace? Are you speaking life in your workplace? Or are you speaking death? You can choose to speak life 
or you can choose to speak death. Are you gossiping or are you proclaiming the name of Jesus? Are you speaking badly about another person because they got a higher raise than you? Or are you speaking power over your job and authority over your job to make sure that God gives you a greater job? You have options here. You just have to make a choice. You can do one thing or you can do another. This is the choice that's been granted to you that comes along with the authority and power that's been granted to you. So use it wisely. Use it wisely. So this was the heart that they had. They obeyed God's instructions. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, God is telling us, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, He says, I will live with them, I will walk among them, I will be their God, and they will be my people. I will walk with them. Will is this like statement. He will do it. He didn't say I might walk with them. I maybe will do it with them. He said I will walk with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Amen. We are people of God. We are people that are his. We belong to him. Amen. So you have the authority and power that comes with God. God is behind you when you just do something. Every time he says, every time you go against the spiritual warfare that you're in right now, God is with you. He's standing with you as you wear the armor of God. Nothing can come against you because God is with you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? If God is for you, who can be against you? Jesus came, as I had stated before, he came with the idea to do two things. One, to destroy the works of the enemy. And two, to bring people back to God. And we can see this in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. And it says, the one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. But the Son of God was revealed for this purpose. He was revealed for this purpose. Keep that in mind. To destroy the devil's works. To destroy the devil's works. And uh, another translation, I think it was the Amplified translation that says to destroy the devil's works and to lead people back to the Father. To lead people back to the Father. See, as I had said before, coming in the form of the baby, he was so humble, obeying in the instructions of the Father, making sure that he was always with the Father, connected to the Father, listening to the Father. When he went into the garden, he prayed, he was with the Father. When he was in a lo alone in a room because everything was so overwhelming, he was alone with the Father, and he would speak to the Father. How often do we speak with the Father in our daily lives today? Sometimes we need to step back and do a reflection on ourselves. Do I speak with the Father daily? Is he my daily bread? Is he the one that sustains me? Or is something else sustaining me in the world today? What is your daily bread? For me, it's Jesus. Jesus is my daily bread. And I know for some of you, Jesus is your daily bread. But for others, you have to make the choice Will you make Jesus your daily bread? Will you? Again, it comes back to your choice. We see in the time when Jesus was getting crucified and just really understand when we talk about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, it's, it's not something that was so simple. I feel like sometimes when we read it, it's just we read it and it says Jesus was hung up on the cross and he was nailed. But when you really just fixate your eyes on what Jesus had to endure for you and take it personally, we're not just reading this as, you know, what he did for me and my parents and my family and my brother and my sister and my aunt and my uncle. But when you read it, can you just fixate on what Jesus did for you? And he said, I love Jennifer, so I'm going to go on that cross for her. I love Rufus, and I'm going to go on that cross for him. I love Sam, and I'm going to go on that cross for him. He called you by name, and because of your name, and because of your, the love that he has for you, he went up on that cross. And now he's in this time when he is 
peers, and he's struggling to breathe. He has to, you know, when you were crucified, I was reading on the actual study of crucifixion, people when they were nailed, when their feet were nailed together, and because your hands are, you know, being raised and you can't really have a lot of breath in your uh, lungs, they would have to push themselves up on their feet to kind of get a little breath so that they can breathe, and then they would put their feet down because you're basically being, you're, you're suffering to death. So Jesus being up on that cross and suffering and hardly having any space to breathe could have easily said, I'm going to destroy all these people because of what they did to me. They don't care for me. I did all these miracles and I did all these wonders and signs for them and yet they still want to do this to me. It says in the book of Matthew chapter 26, I believe 50, verse 56, where Jesus is saying, do you actually think that if I didn't ask my father right now to bring 12 legions of angels, that's 72 thousands of angels, 72 thousand, 12 legions. If I didn't ask my father right now to bring these angels to you and rescue me and destroy the face of the earth, he could have easily. 72,000 angels, can you imagine right now 72,000 angels ready for you? They're drawing up their sword. And if you ask for the power and authority in Christ Jesus, they will accomplish that mission. 72,000 angels. He could have called at them at any second, and they would have came to rescue Jesus because he's the son of God. He's God's own son. But yet he said, no, I love them. I love him. I love her. I have to do this. I need to do this. He took your sin. He took my sin. He took my family's sin. He took my, my friend's sin. And some of my friends don't even know that he took their sin. And yet he still says, I love them. I love them. I love her. But we don't want to acknowledge it. We don't want to understand what Jesus truly did for us. You see, when Jesus coming to this earth, knew no sin. He was the man who knew no sin. He had not one spot of blemish on him. But when he was on the cross, then he took my sins. And when he took your sins, he took the weight of the world and he was hung, hanging up on that cross. Jesus was, in fact, the most closest with the Father, being very close in relationship, in intimacy, in a love he was the closest with the Father, but when he was hanging up on that cross, he was the furthest from the Father. Why was he so far away from God when he was actually the first person to be close to God? Why? Because he took your sins. He took my sins. He had to separate himself from God because God knows no sin. God holds no sin. And because he took the weight of the world's sin upon himself, he didn't want to be near God and kind of give that over to him. Jesus knew what his mission was, to destroy the works of the enemy, to lead people back to Christ. He chose you and he chose me. But for the one who took himself upon the cross, and we sing this so often, crucified, laid behind the stone. You live to die, rejected and alone, like a beautiful rose that was trampled on the ground, you took the fall and you thought of me. He, he continuously thinks of you. It wasn't just then and it wasn't just a couple of years ago, but Jesus continuously thinks of you. Did you know that? Did you know right now that you're on his mind? That you are the apple of his eye? You are. You're made beautiful in his image. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You identify with the Father. You have power and authority. You have dominion over all. You have it, but it's now your time to acknowledge and apply in it. Growing in your authority will be very difficult sometimes because growing in your authority actually means having to obey the word of God. And sometimes we don't want to obey the word of God. It's forgiving when you feel justified not to forgive. It's loving when you feel justified not to love. It's speaking kindly to one another. 
it's making sure that we don't speak about one another in a negative way, but we're rather encouraging one another. If you or anyone beside you or if you know anyone that hasn't been encouraging and has just been speaking badly and negatively about one another, let's just stop. You can't keep going on like this. I was talking to, I think, some of our youth here, and we were saying how, you know how people do that uh, Thing, that new resolution, new mindset of the new year, as soon as January 1st hits and they say, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to eat healthy, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and it only takes like five days for them to stop whatever they're doing. And then they say, I'm going to wait until next year. I still have a whole bunch of months, but in 2025, January 1st, I'll start again. I'll make sure that I clean and eat healthy and go to the gym. But you don't actually have to wait a whole year to make sure that you can just do you can just start now. So you can actually start obeying the word of God now. You can make sure that you forgive now. You can love right now. You can be kind right now. You can stop discouraging one another right now. And you can start encouraging one another right now. All you have to do is choose to obey. Authority comes from obedience. The more you obey the word of God, the more power there is in your authority. So when you obey, when you fast and you pray, when you make sure that you're giving all that you have to Christ, and you're making sure that in everything that you do, you're glorifying God, the power that comes in your authority is heightened, and it comes to fruition. That when you say it, it actually happens. And if you say it and it doesn't happen, don't stop. Keep going. Speak in the name of Jesus. And speak the name of Jesus at all times. Making sure that you give everything to the Father. You were given the authority just as Jesus was given the authority. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that lives within you. You have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who gave power and authority to Jesus. You see, when Jesus came and he was being baptized by John, John actually just baptized him and the heavens opened up and God acknowledged him as Jesus, my beloved son. That's when Jesus had power. So Jesus had power to heal the sick and to make sure the blind would see and that the lame would walk and that the deaf would hear. Jesus had that power. But when he was baptized by John and as soon as he came, came up and the heavens opened and the dove came upon him that's when the holy spirit appeared to him and gave him power and authority to rule over everyone amen he has been given that power and authority so if the same spirit that raised jesus from the dead now lives within you can you imagine the authority and power that you have jesus said more than what he did you can do greater things because of the power and because of the authority that lived within you. Jesus never engaged in any type of conversation with the enemy. We were in fasting and prayer last Saturday, last, last Saturday, last Saturday I believe. And um, we had Pastor Michael who came. And I remember I'm still meditating on the word that he had given that day. And I'm so happy I came to the fasting and prayer. Because he was speaking about how Jesus actually never engaged in any type of conversation with the enemy, ever. He never would do that. But instead, he would prove the enemy wrong by stating scripture and going back to the word. We had a sermon done by Angie a long time ago, and we were reading about how Jesus keeps telling the enemy, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is written that man, uh, that God cannot be tested. It is written. It is written. It is written. How many of our days do we go by where we say it is written? Because you can actually take this scripture and speak against the enemy. You have the authority to do it. God gave you the book to use, not for it to dust around until the next Sunday comes along. Use what has been granted to you. This is my daily bread. It's the 
sustains me. It grounds me. It makes sure that I'm lifted up when my head is cast down low. It makes sure that I know who I identify in. I know that I am a daughter of Christ. I know that I have the Lion of Judah inside of me. I know I have the resurrection power inside of me. But how many of us actually acknowledge that daily? To make it easier for Jesus, he could have easily told Satan, yeah, okay, I'll bow down to you, and yeah, sure, that way I won't actually have to go to the cross. But who remembers in, chapter, in I think, Matthew, when Jesus tells Satan, get behind me, Satan, because you don't actually know the concerns of God, and you are a stumbling block to me. Every day we have to focus on the concerns of God. What does God have a concern of over your life? These are questions that you have to ask Jesus. You can't say, this is what I want, this is what I need, this is what's going to happen, and that's it. But what does God actually have intention for you in your family, in your career, in your workplace, whatever it may be? God has a plan for you, a plan for you to prosper. That's what it tells us in Jeremiah chapter 29. Plans for you to prosper. How are you going to prosper if you don't use the authority granted to you? How can we prosper if we just say, yeah, I'll just give it into God's hands. Whatever he wants to do, he can do. There's some part of you that has to work with God. You are co-leading with God to make sure that what happens in your life is according to his will and his plans for your life. The concerns of God was to bring Jesus so that he can destroy the works of the enemy and that he can make sure that people are led back to him. You see, when Satan gave this opportunity for Jesus and said if you worship at my feet I will give you everything that's a shortcut Jesus could have taken that shortcut but Jesus knew who he belonged to Jesus knew the kingdom and the power and the authority that relied and is in God he knew what it was to be a son of God he knew what it was to be the son of the living God and he knew that this was not the shortcut that I meant to take. So Satan, get behind me. You are a stumbling block. You do not know the concerns that God has for me in my life. Ask God daily, what are your concerns, Lord? What are your concerns? I've been saying this to myself, and sometimes when I speak to others, I'll say it repeatedly. Half obedience is still disobedience. You can't do one and not the other. You can't forgive but not tithe. You can't love but not love this person. And you can't talk to this person but not that person. You can't encourage this person and then discourage that person. Whatever you do to everyone needs to be an equal kind of a thing. Because that's what Jesus does for us. Jesus looks at that sinner in the same way that he looks at me because I am also a sinner. I know that I'm a sinner. We have to acknowledge that we have sinned. We were born as sinners, but we have been made new in Christ. The old has passed and the new has come. Acknowledge that you've been made new in Christ. See, the problem within our churches these days is that sometimes we don't want to look at the right versus the wrong. We don't understand discernment. We don't understand, okay, the word of God says don't do this, so I won't do it. We say the word of God kind of says this, so maybe I'll do half of this and then later on I'll go do something else. Discernment doesn't mean you know right from wrong. Discernment means knowing right versus almost right. Because when you go and do something that is almost right, it doesn't mean that it's right. So no discernment. How do you know discernment? It's by knowing the word of God. When you say the name of Jesus, do you actually understand the power that is in his name? You have the power and authority within you. But it is up to you whether you want to use it and how you're going to use it. There was a verse, uh, sorry, there was a quote that I had read. And it says, the believer who is thoroughly conscious of the divine power behind him and of his own authority can face the enemy without any fear and without any hesitancy. Because God himself is the force behind that authority granted. You don't have to face any fear. You don't have to face anything without, with hesitancy. Because God is with you. And if God is with you, then who can be against you? Amen? 
Amen. I have one more verse that I just wanted to read. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. And I want us to daily look at this and read this over our lives. Proclaim it into your life. Read over it at all times. And if you feel as if something's going off, read it again. Read it again and again and again. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. And it says, Look, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy so that nothing at all will harm you. Amen? He has given it to you. Nothing at all will harm you. If the musicians can come forward. Nothing at all will harm you. Not the kingdom of darkness and no doubt put in by Satan. Nothing can ever touch you. You have been bought by the blood of Jesus. You have been bought by the blood of the Lamb. So you have to acknowledge it. So the last question I have for you is, do you know how you can access this authority? Mark chapter 6 verse 7 talks about the time when Jesus calls these disciples and tells them, now I've given you authority, go into the world and spread my word and spread the good news. I've given you that authority, so go ahead and do it. But how do we do it with this authority? How do I get the authority? First, we have to, A, acknowledge who provided you authority. Acknowledge it. God gave me this authority. That's who gave it to me. You need to be aware of the power that is within you. Who is the power within you? It's the Holy Spirit. He is within you. So acknowledge it and be aware of it. You need to admit and repent of your sins. Authority means obedience. And when we're not obedient and we're being disobedient, that's a sin. Repent of it. Leave it behind. It said, flee from me, Satan. Get behind me. I don't want it. I don't want what you have to offer. It's nothing. It's waste. It's garbage. Jesus has given me the kingdom, the power and the authority. What more could I want? So acknowledge it. Be aware of who gave it to you. And admit and repent from your sins. And lastly, you need to understand on whose account the authority was given to you. It was because of Jesus. Because he hung up on that cross and he said, I love you. I love you. I love you. And because of that account, we have been granted this, that, this power to do things we can hardly even imagine. To do immeasurably more than we can ask think or imagine according to the power and the riches of his glory amen that's what it says in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 all you have to do is acknowledge who gave this to you all you have to do is be aware of who gave it to you all you got to do is admit and repent of your sins and be aware of who gave this power on whose account it was granted to you please if you can just stand with me